God puts us in nations, in places, not by mistake, but to do a job. What if we opened our eyes to the needs of our colleagues, of our leaders, of our subordinates, and we were a priest on their behalf? Welcome to the Repurposing Business Podcast. My name is Brett Johnson. And I'm Lynn Johnson. And we're going to be talking about how to get our business into God's business. Our subtext is Let My Business Go, and we'll have guests from around the world. So thank you for joining us this week and every week on the Repurposing Business Podcast. Welcome to the Repurposing Business Podcast. I'm here with Andrew Chung, who's our guest today. Andrew, it's wonderful to have you on the podcast. Wonderful to be here, Brett. Yeah, Thanks so, so much for having me. Yeah, where are you today? I'm in New Jersey. Um, I was in California for a long time, as you know. Um, and then our company, a lot of the people, a lot of my team went remote. Um, this is when I was at Microsoft. So I wanted to spend more time with family, so I moved out to Jersey. So here I am. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, well, we came through there the other day on our way back from South Africa. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so we met in Silicon Valley, and it was quite a while ago. I think about 2006 or so. Is that when it was? Something around, maybe 2008, that time, Frank. I know I graduated from business school in 07, so okay. maybe it was a year, a year or two after that. But, yeah, it's You're been right. a little while, yeah. So you went to Harvard. Did you Harvard undergrads, Stanford, <laughs> business school. Yeah. That was the Lord. I mean, yeah, yeah. definitely the Lord. I, I have lots of testimonies. Uh, supernatural things happened um, yeah. before I knew supernatural things were allowed. Yeah. <laughs> that was Harvard and at Stanford. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, I I got a perfect score on my SATs. I don't know if you know this, but yeah. um, but I, I got one question wrong, which you, you can get one question wrong, so I get a perfect score. But the one question I got wrong, the word I didn't know was tract, T R A C T. So like a Bible tract that people yeah. hand out. <laughs> so I felt God was telling me, like in retrospect, like you know some things, but you don't know, you know, you don't know the thing, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> you don't know so, the basics of the Bible belt, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that was point one. And then uh, for Stanford, you know, again, this is before I knew all this stuff was legal. I just, you know, was just sitting in my room one day and I just felt like God saying, I'm going to, you know, I was worrying about, you know, which school I was going to get in, blah, blah, blah. and I just felt like God say, like, I'm going to get you into Stanford or, or something to that, to that end. Yeah. And so I applied to a bunch of schools. And, um, but for Stanford, because of this word, I, I was just so open with my application. And I, I wrote a really long, you know, about my missions trips, about all the things that I, I thought about capitalism and, yeah. and God and, and how they can all intersect. And, uh, I, uh, Stanford was the only school I got into it. My top choice and the only school I got into. So fantastic. Well, yeah. that's a wonderful leading when the other doors closed. And <laughs> one, uh, yeah. I remember once when I was at, uh, undergrad and I had to go to one of the, back then it was the big eight. Now it's the big four. Firm, you know? And, uh, so, but I prayed about it and I felt I should go to Price Woodhouse. And so it's the only place I applied. So when I went for the interview, they said, where else are you interviewed? I said, nowhere else. <laughs> I think they felt obliged to give me a job. But there we That's go. That's awesome. That's wonderful. Yeah. So then you oh. came along and you, you've been thinking about work and faith and God and business, a bit, that stuff for quite a while, right? Yeah. You know, well, so, so the testimony, I became basically Christian in college. So I, I, had gone, I had grown up in a Christian home and gone to church, but the relationship didn't become real until college. Yeah. And so when after I went to a missions trip right after college before my consulting, yeah. and then I'm not sure I'd recommend it to everybody, but I probably shaped my life in a, in a good way long term. But, you know, it's like I was like in the, you know, with people seeing people pick their living out of the trash dumps yeah. in the Dominican Republic. Yeah. And then a month later, I'm in like, consulting to you know top 500 i mean they pay for all your meals your i mean it's just yeah. the dichotomy oh my gosh Brett, where were you when i back then? <laughs> but that was the beginning that was the beginning of the 
okay, well, there's got to be a little, there's, there needs to be some kind of congruence because I just could not figure out. Um, and then um, there was one more piece to this. Um, well, that's, oh yeah. So I also got a fellowship while I was doing consulting. Uh, you know, there was a fellowship at my consulting firm to work at a nonprofit that was housed within the consulting firm. And it was a, a venture philanthropy company yeah. where they take venture capital practices and take it to the nonprofit space. And as we're seeing all these things, we're using the balanced scorecard. So, you know, not too dissimilar to, you know, you've probably heard of it or seen it, but not too dissimilar in terms of scorecarding your business. Uh, you guys sit down to read. And um, basically I was like, man, the church needs something like this, you know? And so that's kind of a lot of what the, some of the business school essays is talking about how, you know, seeing that in the Dominican Republic, seeing that economics and business and mm. the way, you know, God works. It's not, I mean, we need the church obviously, but we also need to address this problem of people taking trash for their living. And yeah. so that's when a lot of that was gelled. And then I'll tell you one more piece of this puzzle. Yeah. I went on another mission trip right before business school. This is, <laughs> I don't know it's, if this is ill-advised, but uh, basically it was through InterVarsity and uh, I spent, um, I think it's about an eight, seven or eight week uh, missions trip mm -hmm. um, in Thailand in the slums. I don't know if you know about this, but basically we were living over kind of a sewage area where a village was popped up. And uh, I mean, we're living with family. We're living with families. This is not, this is a, this is more of a hardcore. We're living kind of literally amongst the people. Incarnational was a big piece of the inner varsity model. Floor, were you? What's that? You sleeping inner, inner varsity inner varsity but were you sleeping on the floor when you were there that sort of stuff yeah yeah i think we were there might have been some mats i can't we're definitely on, definitely on the floor but maybe with mats i think yeah. i think that was the, the yeah. thing so um but yeah so coming back from that to business school where people are driving porsches again oh brett <laughs> like it was just one of those moments again where i'm like oh my gosh um and so, yeah, so th a lot of that, like, oh, my God, you know, God, it needs to be in business. Like, a lot of that was, was really kind of formed there. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then, um, yeah, soon after that, uh, we, you know, I was just struggling with the same concept. And then I heard you guys preaching about it. And I, I think I, one of the earliest concepts that really resonated, and I, and I, I don't remember exactly how I got introduced to Reef, but the concept of, like, Egypt versus the promised land and, and works versus like, you, you know, you putting in work, but God sending the rain and the miracles. And mm -hmm. um, that was such an important concept to me because I was, that was like, I always felt like God was like beginning to like show me that. And then you guys were yeah. preaching on it. I don't know, probably yeah. at that point for 10 years, but, but yeah. for me it was like, yeah. Oh my gosh, who are these people? So. No, it's interesting. I've just been thinking about those three economic systems again this last week, sort of the Egypt system, you know, the predictability our effort, but there's a predictable return. And then the desert, you know, when they yeah. went hand to mouth day to day, and we, yep. we kind of put that up as the pinnacle of Christian living, which it isn't, because, you know, as soon as they got to the banks of the Jordan to cross, and cross into the promised land, then the manna stopped. Now it was right. plant, work with God, obey God, the rain comes. Yeah, that shift from Egypt through the desert into the promised land from an economic model perspective is a big deal. Yeah. So, well, you get it. I mean, you wrote the yeah. book. <laughs> you wrote the many books on it. So, <laughs> Yeah, so you went through the repurposing business training. And uh, given that you've thought about this for quite a while, what value add was there in that training? Uh, and I'm asking not to get a compliment just because you'd be, you had been thinking about it. And there's probably a lot of people like you who, do yeah, yeah. I think for me, um, I didn't think there could be people that thought like me. And I, I, it's not that I was thinking, oh, I'm so so much more advanced than anybody. It's just that, you know, when you're kind of, you're doing something you cannot understand, mm. when someone else gives you the language, it it's so reassuring because you know you're not alone, if that makes sense. And yeah. so I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who are in business, uh, care deeply about God, but can't find that convergence of the two things, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so um, giving people a framework, a community, um, you know, various tools and scorecards, um, I think it's helpful for people to find that, that conversion and, and that, that piece really about, you know, how to bring the two things together, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. And that's kind of why we began the journey, just because 
same position as you. I was doing consulting assignments with Pricewaterhouse and consulting to mission organizations. And I'm like, these guys seriously need business consulting, but they are <laughs> bar players and, and preachers and evangelists. But what they yeah. need is, you know, business analysts, IT, marketing, finance, that's what they need. And I was also running a church. So I had a church full of these people who were completely mm -hmm. underdeployed. You know, they right. were sitting there on their skills, waiting to be asked to lead a Bible study or something would which wasn't particularly their sweet spot, you know. So, so that back in the early 1980s got us going on, okay, how do we mobilize these business people out of our church to kind of serve what God is doing in the world? Which is probably a good segue point because you've written a book not that long ago <laughs> called Move, Movements, The Movements of God. Look at that. Awesome. <laughs> I think that's, it's so relevant, you know, because this is the big challenge for business people is how do I fit my business career into the context of what God is doing in the world? That's yeah. the big question. Not I how do I volunteer a little bit, make a little bit of money, do habitat, you know, build a house or something like that. It's you know, how do I fit my career, my work, my business, my startup into what God is doing in the whole world. So yep. you've been yep. looking at this. So tell, what led to you writing that book, Andrew? Um, okay, so uh, about five, five or six years ago, um, the pastor um, at Tree of Life Church, he asked me to preach. So I preached maybe one or two messages, and I created all these PowerPoint slides as a good consultant, <laughs> created all these frameworks. And um, yeah, I just... I was honestly, I just preached and then somebody in the audience said, are you going to write a book on it? And I was like, should I write a book? I don't know. So anyway, I figure um, after that, I might as well like put it onto paper. Um, and, and I don't mean to undersell it. I mean, at that point, I really wasn't thinking about writing a book, but I realized now that I had spent, I got to say like, I want to say thousands, but I have no idea, but thousands of hours uh, listening to different sermons. I mean, when we met, before we met and, and, and a couple years after, I was just, you know, again, I, I didn't know it was legal to hear from God at that point, you know what I mean? So I was just so curious and so unbelievably, you know, I think the right term for it is hungry to understand what's happening around me. And so I heard so many sermons, but I mean, um, and I, I was living um, with, you know, in the family home of a mentor of mine, and he had this enormous you know, I would call it kind of charismatic Pentecostal library, like a room. And I just read so many of those books. I heard so many sermons. I went to so many meetings. And um, I think the book is a result of seeing those, seeing the different things. Because I think from an outsider perspective, um, when you look at the charismatic world, mm. uh, it could either look monolithic like, oh, it's, you know, if you're outside, you just see oh, it's charismatic or, or it could look like there's all these confusing and almost contradictory ideas that are being floated around. Yeah, yeah. And so I basically, um, I basically saw that there were different subgroupings that I thought were really helpful. Um, and I, I kind of identified the Bible verses that many of these subgroupings have pointed to. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know. Should I jump into the book a little bit, Brett? I feel like we're... <laughs> so you've identified like about five major movements, is it, right? So what, yeah. Are they? Yeah. what are they? Yeah. So here we go. So, I mean, you can see here, I put this... If, if This this is like 80% of the value of the book. So <laughs> <laughs> people could just stop here if they want to, honestly. Yeah. But I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say it. So it's a born-again movement. Yeah. And I'll explain what you them are. But born-again, kingdom, grace, glory, and heaven. Yeah. Okay, so the five movements in the church today, and I, I have a quick summary sentence for each of these, yeah. and I'd like to just read them because I'd want to get them right here. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so the born again movement, mm. um, the main idea is personal salvation. Yeah. Um, you know, biblical literacy is obviously paramount. Um, okay. The kingdom movement. And, and so the born again movement, probably the, the pinnacle, so to speak, uh, would be like a Billy Graham. Right. I think everybody in that space would say, hey, he's the evangelist. He's the guy that we all would like to emulate. His yeah. model of integrity, uh, how much he cared about the Bible and personal salvation was, was absolutely. And I think it doesn't matter what type of Christian you are, which movement. I think you pretty much will look at Billy Graham and say that. That was a great man. Yeah. Um, so the second is the kingdom movement. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea here, the main thrust is do the works of the kingdom, yeah. miracles, signs, and wonders. 
Yeah. And, you know, for the later movements, I don't really name names because I think they're earlier before they hit the maturity. So I just want to like give time, you know, for God to do what he's going to do. But I think for this movement, I think right now um, we're hitting some peak, I would say, with Bill Johnson. Yeah. Right. I think Bill Johnson, I think there's been many Pentecostal leaders before him all the way from to Azusa Street. And of course, before that, all the way to the original Pentecost, of course. But, yeah. but I mean, there's been pockets, but I think in the modern day, um, you've seen so many, like the word of faith, you've seen so many different movements, but I think it is now becoming very accessible to people. And, and if you go to church, a quarter of your songs, whether you're Baptist or not, are going to be Bethel songs. I mean, you get my point. I mean, I think it's very pervasive at this point. Yeah. 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 Okay. Then, okay. So um, the next three movements are newer. Yeah. And I, I would say this, um, for the uninitiated, some of these might seem very fringy. Okay. So I'm just giving you the warning now. <laughs> 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 yeah, so don't don't take my uh, church membership card just yet. I'm I'm recording the observations of what's happening. Okay, so I, I'm just tucking it in. Yeah, my 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 card. Okay, but he, here's the the next three: the grace movement. Yeah. Okay. So here, being is greater than doing. Yeah. Stop striving, rest in Him. Mm. Uh, you might hear this as the finished work of the cross movement. Yeah. Um. And so I, I think there are a lot of there are a lot of preachers in this movement, um, and some of them have been around for a, a while. Yeah. But um, the real emphasis here is to look, is to really get out of the cycle of condemnation, guilt, sin, and 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 really just put all of the the moral weight of righteousness onto Jesus. Right. You know, and to live in that place, to yeah. live and just say, you know, the blood. The blood is enough. The blood is all, and anything you add to the blood dilutes it. Mm. Okay, so that's the grace. So you feel really good when you go to those churches. Oh, you feel great. I gotta <laughs> say, you feel really great. <laughs> you feel really good. <laughs> um, okay, and I realize I'm probably reading the wrong statements here because they're not as descriptive as I want. But but I think they're helpful anyway. Yeah. So um, so the glory movement. Uh, I'm gonna be a little more descriptive because they're newer, and so I want people to understand kind of what the distinctions here are. Yeah, yeah. So glory movement is for the sake of the world, for the sake of the name. Okay. So this is, this is, we're repicking up. So, that, so as you can probably imagine the grace movement, it's not really about doing the stuff. It's not really about that. It really is about abiding and enjoying the presence, you know, about the, the new wine and, and, yeah. and very important concepts. But, but here we're going back a little bit more into the stewardship space and the glory movement. Um, Seeking glory that comes from God and not man. Yeah. And then discipling all societies, all areas of society to release the kingdom. Yeah. Okay. And then. So when you say um, glory, it, you're really talking about the restoration of the glory of God in society. What yeah, does it mean yeah, like yeah. for God's glory to be seen again in Absolutely. government, in healthcare, in business, in media, and so on? So Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think you can probably, based on just your statement alone, you can probably see which which bucket reap would probably be most comfortable in yeah 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 but we'll, we'll see we can say that for later. <laughs> okay so the heaven the, the heaven movement um so this is probably the as he is so am i on the earth and this is basically like an enoch like release of walking with christ mm. and this is where the new mystics come in yeah. um the priorities may not seem to line up logically with kingdom advance as defined in a glory or kingdom movement. Yeah. Um, and and the, the example statement I say here is Joshua asked the angel Lord, are you for us or for our adversaries? And the answer, angel says, no, right. Mm -hmm. It's not like the answer, wow. it's supposed to be A or B, I'm but he's he the Lord of hosts. Either you're on my team or you're on the wrong team. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think there's a little bit of, okay, we're operating in a different dimension here. And um, I, I mentioned a couple uh, different people here, but um, uh, St. Patrick, for example, was someone yeah. who I think um, clearly operated not in let me lay hands on you, which is very powerful, but you know, the stories of the enemies were coming and like to the enemy's eyes, he looked like a deer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah. uh, brother Yuan, the heavenly man, the book, the heavenly man, where, I mean, things were happening like, 
you know, he was in jail and the, the doors opening, just like Peter. I mean, the yeah. stories, I mean, the stories are incredible. Yeah. And um, I think that is where, um, that is where that comes into play. Yeah. So the new mystics who are out there, I know you don't want to name names, but there's a bunch of them who are out there, which kind of scares the life out of some of the other groups, right? I mean, they, they all probably scare each other a little bit, right? Absolutely. Is that absolutely. your point that there's something to be gained from all or what's Absolutely. Your... Absolutely. And so I will, there is something I want to say here about, okay, so I want to show you one more graph here that I'd like okay. to show you uh, about the, about the scariness and, and the scariness, I don't know if it's intentional or if it's human nature, mm. but there's a little bit of a dynamic and I put this in the book of there's the incumbent and then there's the startup. Right. Right. And the incumbent is always like, we've got, we figured it out. We, we got, we understand Christianity yeah. or, or the market. Let's not say the Christianity. Let's say the market. Yeah. You know, customers don't need anything new. They just need more of us. Right. That's the incumbent mentality. Right. Yeah. So they're and then all the of, IBM of the church world in the old days. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. That's right. Others, you'll never get your, yeah. The, the, nobody gets fired for buying IBM, right? That's right. And nobody gets their church card revoked by going to IBM, right? <laughs> okay. So here's the graph, but here is movement now. Yeah. Now there's a little sway back and forth. Yeah. And the, the idea is that on the left side here yeah. is, is stewardship. Right. Yeah. You know, are we stewarding souls, right? Yeah. Okay. Or are we starting to walk into the supernatural relationship? Yeah, yeah. And so there's a little bit of a swing back and forth. So let me just like walk it through. So born again, there's a really strong emphasis on, hey, we've got to finish the task. I think there's a little bit of that that commission call. Like we've got to make disciples in every ethnos, right? We've got to do that, that the Ralph Winner and all that, which is remarkable and amazing. Now the supernatural relationship is still stewardship. You still want to be doing miracles and preaching the kingdom. Now we're broadening the definition of what it means to be a disciple. Yeah. But but also there's a little bit more of that. Wow, the Holy Spirit, we're welcoming him in. We can now hear. It's legal to hear now, right? Those kind yeah. of things. Um, grace. So I think we kind of touched on this in the supernatural relationship. It is, it swings very far um, to the other side. Yeah. And as you can imagine, grace centered churches, it really is very relational. And um, I would say very relational with the Lord. I, yeah, very relational with the Lord. And I think there's a lot of, it feels good, as you said. Yeah. Um, glory swings back the other way. Yeah. So um, glory is all about the stewardship of the nation. So very stewardship focused, very, very calling focused. And I, I have some specific ways that I like to define glory. I want to dive into that because I think that's probably the most yeah. interesting to, to the reef community, especially. Mm -hmm. And then heaven goes back into that supernatural relationship because we're clearly moving we're clearly moving to, you know, you can see the, the Joshua, the glory movement saying, hey, are you with us? Or are you, you know, against us? And then the heaven movement's like, no, like there's something different happening, you know, and it's like a, almost like a, a different realm happening. Okay. So that is it. So that, I mean, that's the, that's the main framework. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, in this book, I, I actually walk through each movement because of the swing to your to your question um each movement because it swings back and forth it in some ways it really lends itself to what are you doing or you're almost undermining undermining the elemental principles of how we how we operate so right. you know you might say the kingdom people would say we've got to go out in the streets and evangelize where the grace people are like i'm just going to enjoy the relationship with the lord right, right? right. and you can see how that that criticism goes back and forth. Right. And usually the older movements will typically say, whatever the newer movement is heretical. Yeah. Right. So the, the born again movement, you see it, you see it a lot. You know, Bill Johnson is a heretic or all the people that came before him is a heretic. Yeah. And then in the kingdom movement, when people look at the finished work of the cross people, again, you, you know, that's not biblical. <laughs> they, they say the exactly the same thing. Um, and then, um, you know, the, the grace people will say, oh, you guys are strivers, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Same thing happens for glory, glory to grace, uh, sorry, grace to glory to heaven. So mm -hmm. all these movements will have reasons. And, but the idea, the idea really, um, and here's the Billy Graham quote that I want to read. Um, the idea is um, these, these movements are not meant to be, okay, the biggest idea of the book may not be the observation of the movements, but the idea that people in different movements should love, respect, and serve each other. Surprise, surprise, 
people express Christianity differently, and we should be united in love. Yeah. Billy Graham said it best, the one badge of Christian discipleship is not orthodoxy, but love. Mm-hmm. Christians are not limited to any church. The only question is, are you committed to Christ? Right. So I, I, I think that is truly the, 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 the thing that we're looking for here, is that when we think of unity, yeah. we're not looking at, we, you know, unity even within a movement is hard, but we're actually looking for unity that goes beyond movements. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to do that, you've got to have a, as you say, I mean, I guess this is where Paul gets to, you know, you can do all of this stuff, but at the end of the day, there's, there's the love side, right? It, and the love is the thing that is the wrapper around this. And if you don't have that, you've got a problem, whether you're tilted towards the charismatic side or to the orderly work side. You know, as 1 Corinthians 14 says, let all things be done decently and in order. And the Pentecostal say, let all things be done. And the other say, <laughs> let all things be decent and in order, you know. <laughs> and the That's funny. Interesting. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, the other thing Billy Graham said is that he sees that one of the next big moves of God would be in the marketplace. So you're a business guy as well. Yep. So yep. Uh, what do you see, either the role of the marketplace or where do you see evidence of these five things in the marketplace? I mean, In the marketplace, good yeah. question. You know, because you know, see, one, yeah, of the, ahead, yeah. one of the reasons why I see people open to uh, you know, the signs and the wonders or the experiential or the, and when I say people open, I'm talking about people from all faiths. I mean, there are in India, there are people who hire gurus to find the, the uh, auspicious time to release a product, for example, yeah. you know? or in uh, Silicon Valley, they hire people to deal with mindfulness or whatever, you know, there's always yep. new labels, but That's there's right. kind of an openness to spirituality in the workplace. Yep. And so where do you see these things touching in the world of business? That is a good question. Um, let me think about how to answer that while I kind of, I want to find this bullet point for us to kind of go through because this would, I think, relate very much to Reap's um, um, kind of arena. So I, I would say this. So I think, um, I think there are, there are clearly believers. Okay, so clearly believers are in these five buckets. Right. And clearly people, the believers are not, all the believers are not clergy. Right. Mm-hmm. So they're going to be business people. So the first point is that there will be Christians in each of these realms. Now, I think the way that you as a Christian could think about the marketplace from these different buckets would look very different. Mm-hmm. And so, for example, and I think this is some of the things that you speak about. Um, and I, I, well, I, this first, is just on, this, on the first one, for example, if you go back in the history of like God doing stuff in the marketplace, you go back to full gospel businessmen's fellowship, right. CBMC Christian businessmen's committee, which is now called connecting business in the market to Christ. Cause it's got to be open to ladies and so on. Or, or I to, see. Okay. So they have to change that. But the big emphasis of some of these things was evangelism, you know, the, in some there of the, ones, which kind of ties in with the born again thing. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And then you kind of get your next one is, is the kingdom, right? And so then you, you, so then you get people saying, okay, what is, what does the kingdom look like in business? And maybe that's where you get, if you look at something like, um, uh, international Christian chamber of commerce, for example, um, Gunnar Olsen and those guys. And I mean, they actually thought about, okay, so how do I do stuff in my business? They're running companies, they're doing business, they're opening Christian chambers of commerce, they're touching a bit into government and other spheres. So they're thinking a bit more about, okay, the business has got to have a purpose out there in, in terms of extending the kingdom. Some of it was still evangelism and so on, but it was more supernaturally marked. I mean, they were seeing, you know, uh, Gunnar's got that lovely book, Business Unlimited, you know, where yes, yes, yes. miraculous stuff take place and all that kind of stuff. So I would say that's what I would see some of those guys, which is also probably back in the 80s, starting to evolve in the 80s, while the born again crowd with Demas Shakarian and some of those other guys and the market it was sort of back in the 60s, 70s, paralleling the Billy Grammy kind of things, I would say. Yeah. In terms Absolutely. of the grace stuff, um, that's an interesting one, right? In terms of just like, because business people are a little bit more action oriented. And yes. uh, I remember a pastor in a major church saying to me that they prayed for big business guys to come into the church and they came into the church. He had heads of strategy of big companies and everything. And he said, Brett, there's one 
word to describe the business guys in my church. I said, what's that? He said, bored. They're completely <laughs> bored. You know, because, so I'm not so sure that the just soak and lounge around and do all that kind of stuff is, is that well suited towards the business people. I think they might stay there for a little yeah. while, have a cup of coffee and then move on to glory. <laughs> I think you're right. I, I think you're right. I think that's exactly right. I think that it, in some ways there's a dichotomy there. Um, and there might be, you know, maybe some exper experientially related businesses. Um, but I think you're right. I think the glory is where you start to see, okay, now we're going to get into this place of convergence. Mm -hmm. um, of, and, and, and I, I want to say one other thing about the, this. It's not meant to be a progression as in like, oh, you, you go to the bottom and you've won. Mm -hmm. um, but it is kind of uh, the maturity of each of these movements in the earth. Yeah. But, but one thing that is progressive about this is that each of these helps you learn something from the next one. Yeah. So I, I think a really big one for, for me, um, and I think it's really important for me, was when I was trying to go from kingdom, what Bill Johnson was saying and doing, into glory, into a personal calling or seeing, this is, the glory to me is where people start moving into their prophetic promises. Yeah. And everything is so individual. It's like, you're not trying to be somebody else. You're trying to be who God created you to be. And, and um, I think part of this whole thing is, is God's glory is displayed in people, in the uncut stones, not, not the cut stones that are formed in, in the pattern of the world, but really uncut stones. And, mm. and I think you start learning how valuable you are to God yeah. in the grace movement you start starting to see that individuality in the grace movement and you start seeing you know striving is over in the grace movement but also the need for striving is also over yeah. you know that it's it's not Would just you, that you so experience you grace identity there is that what you're saying would you say you settle your identity more in the grace movement i think you do i really think you do and i think it's 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 almost like it's not just fun to be there but it's also the things of the world you know gross go grow dim you know, and I know that's not the end all, but it's kind of like when you're there, you find yourself in the relationship with God. And yeah. then, you know, no. theoretically or hopefully the idols seem to hold on to you less. Yeah. And so I think for everybody, it's important to go through that grace period, sure. uh, the grace movement period, you know. And I think regardless of which movement you a person lives in, I believe that they will experience pieces of all of this. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you, I, 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 that's what, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So let me let me jump into. Um, yeah, feel free to. I like. I love these questions, but I'm gonna just just talk about some of the bullet points. So each of the each of the movements, I've got like thirty tw twenty to thirty bullet points on on the ideas, the core principles of the movement, and the core philosophy. Yeah, sure. So for glory, I want to talk about that because I think um, I, I was thinking, what's the right way? But in some ways, reap is like a first fruit of this movement. You know, I think you guys have done this a long time ago before, you know, Bill Johnson and all these guys were as popular as they are now. You know, I'm sure, you know, 20 years ago, you guys being as charismatic as, as you are now, I have no idea if you still were 20 or 30 years ago before I joined, but um, obviously it was, it was new. And for some people it was like, oh, what's this, you know, is it legal, you know, to that point. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. So let me just talk about the summary. Mm. Um, this glory movement, stepping into the personal promises of God. God created good works for you to do. A unique promised land for all people. Each promised land is unique and as beautiful as all of us are. We are reflections of his handiwork and marvelous work of creation. Um, step into the heart of kingship and servanthood. Work from identity, victory, and approval. And I, I know that these are concepts in the kingdom movement, but I think by, um, by going through the period of grace, the striving that can really accompany these ideas is really just falls away. Yeah. And I think that is one of the beautiful things about the progression. Um, so in some ways you're saying the glory stage is like kingdom applied, right? I think, I think it is. Yes. Yeah. I think it is exactly. It's like grace is, is really the empowerment of the Holy spirit, yeah. you know, and kingdom is like, Hey, this is, the, this is the right orientation, but the right orientation without without <laughs> the gas is really hard. It's really hard. Yeah. yeah. Um, so okay, here's what you're looking for. You're looking for a new paradigm shift, shift from knowledge to power, mm -hmm. and the ability to bear fruit and fruitfulness. Mm -hmm. You are carrying the rest of grace into the mission. Yeah. I think a big marker of what you you're looking for in this in this um, glory movement is joy. 
Yeah. So you're asking in Jesus' name and receiving that, that your joy might be full. Mm-hmm. Um, crowns, you know, kings acknowledging that Jesus is worthy of glory, honor, and power. Yeah. Um, this is, you know, when you see the, when you see it happening, when it's like yeah. done or, you know, at the height, you'll see the seven mountains being affected. You'll yeah. see the transfer of wealth that people have been talking about for a long time. Yeah. Um, and, it, and the keys they'll be looking for, you know, what happened to David, Joseph, and Noah at the time of their breakthrough? Mm-hmm. Um, you look at the heyday of Solomon. These are concepts that, that I'm, very, I'm very familiar with. Mm-hmm. Um, the journey and the then the journey and the discipline are for you, and the release of blessing for the others around you. Yeah. So you you are intentionally going on a journey. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, and uh, look for righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So I think there's a lot here. Um, so yeah. Andrew, how are you applying this in your startup? <laughs> you startup now in New York City. Right. Yeah, yeah. You're, yes. you're in on a whole new incubator, business accelerator, startup kind of deal, boot camp. And yeah. uh, so as you go to, uh, as you're working every day, you're not going to work because you're kind of uh, working remotely, I presume. But yeah, um, yep, that's right. But you, you know, um, you remind me of the John fifteen fifteen. Jesus says, in effect, he says, look, if you don't know my dad's business, you're not my friend. Uh, he says, yeah, you know, yeah, long, yeah, yeah. it's back to the, the grace thing. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't understand the business, right? But I call you friends because everything that the Father's revealed to me, I've revealed to you. Therefore, you can ask whatever you want. You can abide in me and you can. So there's a collaborative arrangement between Jesus yep. and his friends. And I presume that you're doing your level best to take that into the marketplace to work from a place of rest. You've kind of alluded to the fact that we strive to enter God's rest, which is the Hebrews 4.10 thing. So, um, uh, so you try to work from a place of rest, but in a startup in New York city, how's that working out? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great question. And I think, okay, so I have had, you know, before I got accepted into this program, I've had all these amazing I would call them mystical encounters. Yeah. And so I think, you know, maybe God was helping me because the heaven part was really the part of the book that's probably most new uh, to me and uh, most new in the world. But, but after I got into the program, it, it felt like a different season was, was, was going. And, I, and I'm hoping that, that the season coincides with the glory season yeah. uh, because it feels much more practical. Right. You know, I'm talking about in the heaven season. Um, I mean, just different visions of, have, I mean, just like really wild encounters, you know, yeah, yeah. And, um, the glory season, I get this sense um, and I'm still parsing it out myself, to be honest. Um, so I feel, you know, in my good moments, I'm feeling like the idea of striving is a little bit, it feels foreign to me, not, not in the sense of, I don't feel it, but I, I guess, you know, it's not your operating principle anymore if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. If it, before where before maybe in my early days, when I just found out about Reeve Reeb and, and kind of the principles we were talking about, it was still part of my DNA from the training of, you know, of all, you know, yeah. And I think that, you know, university of desert and all the things we talk about, I think some of that just becomes, it feels foreign at this point. So, but I think what um, I am still trying to figure out something, which is I know there's a prophetic word and I'm, now, rather than, I think the early days of my charismatic journey, I felt like you hear a prophetic word and you definitely hold on to it, which is still true. But I think that it was almost like every moment you're trying to figure out and, you know, am I doing the right thing? Am I going the right way? Like, yeah. it's almost like, um, I don't even know how to explain it, but maybe you have a like you're in the desert actually, and you don't want to take a wrong turn in the desert, you know, because I think that's exactly right. You lose the manner. You could lose it. Whereas now as a son of God, a daughter of God, you know your identity, you know, your purpose. And it's less about, you know, there's a lovely scripture where God says, I'll counsel you with my eye upon you. It's just like, you know, your dad's looking at you. He doesn't even actually have to say anything, right? You just, you just know he's got his eye on you. It's not like every day, God, what do you want me to do today? Yes, Salt yes. first, pepper first, do I do this? Where do I? The guy who was, he was probably a New Yorker who was put in his closet, putting on his tie one day and he's asking God, you know, 
do I put on this tie or that tie? And then yes, the yes. you know, I'm your father, not your mother, right? <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, it's, that's a joke. But, but it is in the early stages, it's do I do this, do I do that? Now it's okay, I'm in you, you're in me, you've settled my identity, I have a purpose. Now, how do we collaborate together while I stay in your presence while I'm working? So I'm working from a place of rest. I think that's exactly, I, I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> I mean, I guess you're going to write the chapter two of this book, but, but, but really that is, Brett, that's exactly, that's exactly how I feel. I, I, in fact, I feel that I can't, not in a bad way, I can't even get the answers to the questions I was trying to get before, because I feel like in the University of the Desert and in the Place of Grace, like the hearing became easier. It really like from the, from the place of, you know, from 10 years ago, all of a sudden it just felt easier to hear from God. And now I don't think the skill is gone. I just feel like the season is different. Yeah. And I feel like that, I feel exactly like I just said, it, I think, I don't think I could describe it better. Mm. I feel like the Lord is, has his eye on me. Yeah. I can be confident. And when I'm looking for answers, it's almost the wrong thing to do. It's, yeah. I feel like I, there's some grace for it, but I just feel like it's not, mm. You're in the promised land, and it's like, which candy should I be eating? And I'm not saying like everything. Yeah, I mean, that's how I feel. I mean, mm. I can't say any better than you said it. I mean, it just feels like the Father has His eye on you, and it is a season of trust. Like the yeah. Lord has put something in you, and you know, express it. Like uh, be a steward, you yeah. know, but the, but express it. And yeah, you don't need to fall into fear. You don't need to fall into striving. Yeah, um, it's it's about expression. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. So this is good because, you know, as we come out of this COVID-19 season, I think that people have an opportunity to learn to go back to, to rest, to trim away some of the stuff like there's a giant pause on the earth. And it would be a sad thing if God's people went back to the rat race, as it were, went back to the treadmill and didn't carry with them the lessons of this rest period, you know. Yeah. So um, there remains then a Sabbath rest, you know, but to rest, to, to achieve that, we have to rest from our own work. So it's, it's how do we not lazy, we're not thoughtless, we're not bad stewards, but we're settled. And yes. so hopefully we can take that out of this uh, crisis season and, uh, and that that would be a, that plus the love you spoke about, right? I found one of the things out of the season is that people are uniting more. Why? Because, I mean, how much water you use for baptism or how far you raise your hands in worship right. or whether you go to heaven and back and so on is kind of right. less <laughs> important than the important things of life, right? The important yeah. things yeah. of life, which is an opportunity for that as well. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. There, there is two more. Yeah. Can I just ask two more yeah, go ahead. I wanted to ask you how people can get a hold of your book. It's on Amazon. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay, again, The Movements of God. Yeah. Um, here's the author right there. And so on Amazon, um, I sell it on Kindle. And yeah. um, I'm trying to make it really accessible. So I made the, the Kindle version $5. So Yeah, fantastic. I hope, yeah, I hope it's, uh, well, yeah, you well. know. We'll get that linked out to your to Amazon for you, and uh, and hopefully many will read because I think it's it's a wonderful. It's almost a story of a personal journey as well, right? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to share just two more things real quick. I think um, yeah. so. I think so. We talked about the framework. So the framework has what we talked about plus those bullet points for everything, plus a quick story, a vignette of what these uh, movements can look like for people who might not be quite as familiar with the movements, but also um, there's two more things, um, two more sections, and there's a lot of Bible verses about which Bible verses are key verses for the movements. Um, but, but also there's, there's two more sections, and the sections are, one is, you know, kind of how is the church changing? Mm. You know, vis-a-vis, -vis, all these things are happening, okay? And then there is a, there's a something, there's more than that. There's, there's the movements, they're specific, but then there's the common thread, which is, you know, there's always going to be churches. There's always going to be, you know, people gathering. And so one one thing that we've put here, and it doesn't matter which movement you care about, and the right. pictures might not be that clear, but mm. but I'll just describe them. On the left side, we've got the church as castle model. Yeah, yeah. And on the right side, we've got church as incubator model. Yeah. And so really on the church, it's it's the building, it's the organization. It's in some ways, it's 
it's the wineskin. But on, but on a new model, it really is the empowered ecclesia. It's the mm-hmm. people, two or three are gathered in my name. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it really is a hopeful picture of, of the empowered church. Yeah, yeah. It is new new models of of leadership, and whether you call them apostles or yeah. you know community leaders or you know fathers of a city or or a nation, it really is um, a spirit almost in a way of people really desiring collaboration and arising raising people up and not really having uh, so much um, do we call it stricture right? It's 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 not having too much. Uh, Allowing people to be people, allowing people to be who they are, um, and, and maybe feel more organic. Yeah. Um, the next concept here is that the role of the church will change a little bit too in yeah. this in this context. And the idea is, it will help people move from sozo where they're really just in such bondage. Yeah. That could be you know health, financial, yeah. mental, whatever the case might be, into a place of shalom where yeah. there's just peace and nothing lacking. Yeah, and the king, the the days of Solomon, I believe, is is in in some ways that 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 shalom, where really silver was as nothing, yeah, yeah, and yeah. finally glory. Yeah, yeah, and that's where people are individually stepping into their like promises. And so, what I'm hoping for and looking for is the churches where you see people saying, you know, not like, hey, Brett, you should lead a Bible study, but you should form this organization called Reap and launch people to kingdom business all over the world. You know, you want that pastor, and, and that's what I'm hoping that churches become. Um, it's kind of yeah. interesting with the current crisis because, in some respects, if you put this in business language, you know, it's kind of the one, the castle model is like the corporate headquarters kind of model. You know, this is, you know, the big whether it's an or the Oracle Towers on the 101, that's or right. it's the Sears Towers in Chicago, or mm-hmm. uh, you know, different towers in different places to kind of more a distributed business model. Now you're going to have to work from home, you're going to have distributed locations, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's, it's almost an opportunity to return to, and it's not to say, I mean, I think you're always going to have the stadiums, you're going to have the big ones, you're going to have the short, yep. you know, I'm not worried about the future of the church and it's going to pop up in many different forms. However, hopefully there will be more of an organic popping up in startups, in offices, in libraries, in hospitals, in universities, and so on. In other words, that it will, I heard some people say, oh, yeah, you know, the church has finally got out of the building. Well, I think the church left the building about 10 years ago, you know, 10 years before the coronavirus thing. It just took the virus to realize that, you know, it was time to sort of, to to show people that you can do church anywhere seven days a week, you know. And uh, so it sounds like... uh, there could be some of that in what you're talking about. Amen. Amen. Okay, la- I'll show you the one last graph. So there's a whole section that I, I haven't shared. It's basically if you're stuck and you can't seem to get or see the next uh, season or movement, mm-hmm. here are the things to watch out for. Here are the things that, you know, could affect or block your ministry. Just it's, it's meant to be, you know, again, I think the principle of the grace, the grace season really is you're not trying to look at the negative. You're really trying to look at the positive. And I, I think that's really positive, but I put it there as kind of like, not exactly a checklist, but something like that to help you if, if you need it. Um, and I think really look for Jesus is the real key, but but it's there for your for, for people's help. I've got, I've got some indicators that would show you where you are in regard to the seasons, uh, signposts, clues that would tell you what's going on in terms of those major movements. Something, yeah, exactly, exactly. And also if you skip a movement, what you might expect to see and then like it's all these little little okay you know, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah put some consulting in there i just in the last chapter yeah yeah you gotta do that, you gotta do that. yeah you gotta do that fantastic yeah, and, excellent and the final the final slide is just just uh, a movement and what you need to see a movement you know the attractiveness of the movement sustainability the yeah. accessibility and reproduction you know yeah. i think it's a pretty standard idea but all these movements as they succeeded have elements of that and i think the main thing to realize for a pastor, for example, or for any Christian who's curious about why do there need to be other movements? Well, it's attractive. Yeah. And it's attractive because it's a filling kind of a heart need of people, yeah. whether it be for greater knowledge of spiritual life in him or yeah. realizing, I know God has more planned for the world mm-hmm. than, than the way that we're polluting it. And I mean, I'm, I'm just picking an example, but there's, a, there's an attractiveness to people that really speaks to them. And so I think... Uh, by by looking out for any of these different movements, um, I think I'll, I'll say something interesting too. I think I think there's a big movement to deconstruction 
But I, I think the alternative to deconstruction um, is, is really people looking at there's other things that God is doing and maybe their heart cry is for something else that's happening. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah. I think that they're, instead of pulling back, which maybe for some people, if they've been really hurt, you know, I don't want to speak to that, you know, counseling. And I think that's all very valuable, but I think that um, I, I do think there's great adventure. Let me put it that way. There is great adventure out there. And so if people are feeling something, an itch or something is wrong or, or, or whatnot, I think people can look differently at the world and look for other so it sounds like what you're saying Andrew, is that one reaction to not liking what you see is to pull out to just go missing in action to right. leave the field another is to say actually there could be another part of the team that i could be playing with that's better suited to where i am yes, yes. so rather than pull out press into something that looks a bit different because what you've experienced, whether it's grace, whether it's kingdom, whether it's salvation, whatever the whole thing, it's not the only stuff that's there and there are other people who have a similar thirst and hunger. Amen. Could have said it better, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Well, Andrew, it's been great chatting with you and uh, blessings to you. And uh, I was been thinking a bit about Moses, you know, and the whole letting the people go. And I kind of feel that it's the same cry in God's heart is let my business go, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I'm just trusting that uh, as you're doing your new startup, whatever it might be, your new adventure, that it'll be something that God blesses, but and where you're able to experience the things that you've learned and take them into one place and have a wonderful, wonderful collaborative time with God in what you're doing. Amen. Amen. Great. Oh, wonderful. Okay. All right, Brad. Thank, Thank you so much. You, Andrew, and we're going to find your book on Amazon. And Amazon. We look right. forward to hearing about the next step in your journey. Amen.